Right. So, so you talked about uh, BMCs, and we're definitely going to get back to that in the future. But uh, can you talk a little bit about just like the general architecture of uh, of Google servers and what role a BMC is playing? I guess in, in Google servers, but also more generally. Yeah, the concept in in like a server is that the main CPU is usually doing some work that's owned by some team, uh, and they have applications that they're dealing with and whatever. But uh, often it's a separate team or organization that's responsible for the hardware management. So it's like keeping the machine physically turned on and running and reporting the health information about hard drives and fan failures and that kind of stuff goes to your IT or data center operations folks, whereas application type failures go to your the team who actually is using the machine. And so... A long time ago in a faraway planned IBM or sorry Intel worked with a couple of their companies to create IPMI which um, specifies how a, a BMC exists on a system and it really starts as like doing environmental control and power monitoring and having a way of querying that type of information from the host processor um, so it's about offloading all of that and one of the key aspects is that you can access that information even if the host machine is completely locked up or turned off so you can also do things like reset the system. You can power it off. You can power it back on. Um, and over time, that feature set has grown more and more and more to the point where you have an integrated uh, KVM support. So you can actually just go to a website that's run by the BMC on that process uh, on that server board. It's actually an entirely separate computer on the same motherboard as the main system. But you can go to a website that's hosted by that, get a UI that... Uh, loads and gives you a display of what the actual console output looks like from the, you know, if you hooked up a monitor on the VGA port, you see the exact same thing and you have right. keyboard and mouse control and you can select like an ISO image, you know, like a, a like a CD image and have it be mounted as a virtual CD-ROM drive on the remote system. So you can do like complete <laughs> from scratch OS installs. Right. Um, remotely and so there's a lot of useful features for that i mean it falls under a lot of uh, larger category folks talk about is lights out management you know the idea that the lights are turned off in the data center nobody has to be there this is how you know how you manage and interact with the systems without having to physically be there and also knowing when you actually do have to go physically touch them you know oh a fan failed i gotta go replace that so is the uh, the whole interface, like the HTTP API that it sounds like you're explaining there, is that part of IPMI or is that uh, just kind of like vendor-specific uh, implementation? So IPMI is, is old. Um, IPMI came out of the late 90s, and there's there was a, a couple revisions of it. And it is not, it is its own bespoke protocol, right? Okay. It's, a, it's something that you talk over TCP and um, have very specific data frames and stuff. And so that's when you run like IPMI tool on a Linux machine or something like that. You're, you're speaking these, this custom protocol to that device. So the web UIs became as a way to like introduce a more friendly way of doing it through the web browser once the web had really become a big thing and people realized that you could run a web server on one of these um, as a friendly thing. But yeah, it's more bespoke. There's been a, a change in the past 10 years of there is a, a later standard called Redfish, which is kind of reimagining IPMI as a REST API. So it, it looks more like you'd expect for a web interface as an API, um, but it, it kind of has the same data model as IPMI. It's like you ask the system, how many sensors do I have? And, and then it comes back and it's like, oh, well, which ones of those are temperature sensors? You know, like, here you go. Right. Is the uh, are, are IPMI or Redfish or any uh, any alternatives, if there are any, uh, are they ever used outside the context of data centers? Um, or is this, you know, mostly a, a pretty focused uh, protocol? Um, I mean, it's it's mostly used for dedicated server hardware, um, mm -hmm. whether that's using a data center or not kind of depends. I mean, I have a, the, the machine I'm on right now happens to have a BMC and can actually do all this stuff. Do I use it in my house on a regular basis? Mm -hmm. No, not really. Right. <laughs> um, but yeah, it tends to be focused on that out of, man uh, out of band management, you know, lights out management type situation. Um, and so that mostly finds its way in server gear. Sometimes you find it in like industrial control equipment um, that's based on PC stuff, you know, like there's various applications for it, but it doesn't show up in your, 
usually doesn't show up in your average uh, PC, although there was a, uh, a th there is a parallel in laptops. Um, Intel has uh, what they call AMT, which is not a BMC, and it doesn't really speak IPMI, but it offers most of the same functionality. So you can do remote management of laptops. And again, it's intended for an IT department to be able to fix your laptop for you from wherever you happen to be. Gotcha. I, one of the things that uh, kind of stuck out to me in your your description of BMCs was you led with the uh, like organizational component of it. And obviously, there there are some technical benefits to the isolation, and like you said, you know, the lights off management and that sort of thing. Um, but I think that is always an interesting way to you know approach any system design as oh yeah, there's there's a different team that does that and it's responsible for that. So we literally have you know a, a different computer for them. Um, I haven't heard it explained that way. So, uh, but that makes a lot of sense. I mean, it's a, it's a long-term thing where I don't know that that was the original intent. Right, right. However, a lot of solutions end up growing according to how organizational lines fall. Um, and so that's how a lot of the feature set has developed for BMCs over time, which has interesting implications because the security model did not evolve the same way. <laughs> right. One of the the things you find quickly in that space is there are two companies that make BMC processors. There's A-Speed and there's Nuviton, and that's it. Um, and part of that just comes with, it's a very strange set of hardware capabilities that you're looking for. It's not about the software. Um, you know, why can't you use an ST Micro for it? Well, I need like 15 I2C controllers. <laughs> and I need six PWM controlled fans with tachometers. Uh, and I also need custom protocols that the processor vendors make up. And, you know, that's just not a thing that you, you find in general. And so there was always this thing of, well, the A-speed parts are not great. They're, they're not well designed. And the Nuvaton ones are expensive. So what if we made our own? One large thing you were uh, a part of or kind of uh, discovered while at Eclipsium was this USB Anywhere vulnerability mm -hmm. and you've given some some talks on it and, and we can certainly link those in the the uh, show notes as well as the the report itself uh but do you kind of want to run through uh what usb anywhere um is and also how you went about discovering it yeah usb anywhere is a vulnerability related to you uh bmc virtual media so we kind of mentioned this earlier, you know, BMCs offer this lights out management capability. And one of those things is I don't want to have to walk into the data center to stick a CD into a machine to reinstall the operating system or to update the device drivers or whatever. So instead, it has the capability for from your web browser mounting a CD image as a virtual CD-ROM drive on the server somewhere else. And I was always just curious how that actually worked, is really how it how it started. Uh, I knew from my work on OpenBMC that the, the hardware level was um, a dedicated piece of hardware that emulates a USB device. So uh, you, you see this in mobile phones. This is kind of how like USB to go works, um, where you, you know, if you plug in... Um, a USB, or when you plug your phone into uh, your computer and it's like, here, you want to download your photos, like the phone chip actually has the same kind of hardware where it can emulate any USB device. Like it, it, it's a USB endpoint that doesn't have a fixed device to it. It's not one specific thing. So you write software to implement what it does, you know, how it responds to requests. And so I knew that that existed in the BMCs and that the firmware was actually deciding what level of, or like what kind of devices it was. That's how your keyboard emulation works, how your mouse emulation works, how your, you know, a lot of different things. But the virtual media, I was like, how is this getting from my browser all the way there? Mm -hmm. Because it doesn't seem like it was transferring the entire uh, file over before starting it. Um, and so it turns out that it, it's a horribly insecure protocol. What, what actually is happening, uh, is that in older one, uh, older BMCs, they would ship a Java application to you. Um, on newer ones, they do it via HTML5, which is kind of even worse. 
um, in some ways. But essentially, um, like in the HTML5 version, there is a JavaScript library running that in your browser that is an entire SCSI stack. And it is actually, and an ISO file parser. And so it's actually JavaScript running in your browser opens the file in your local machine and re like presents that as a block device to a virtual SCSI device that knows how to answer SCSI requests like it is a virtual CD-ROM drive. And that is connected over a web socket to the BMC. And then the BMC is effectively just sending, forwarding the request back and forth. It's actually speaking raw USB um, uh, requests over that. It happens to be sending USB mass storage, but it's actually just sending raw USB packets. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, this is always comes as my example for when folks are like, how bad can it be for, you know, they're like, I've seen the worst thing in programming. I'm like, have you ever seen a SCSI implementation in JavaScript? Yeah. Um, <laughs> and so the Java version is, is very similar. It happens to be written in Java with a, with a JNI extension, but it's the same basic problem. And uh, it turns out that, you know, they had just built their own thing. Uh, the vendor had a long time ago and had not really updated it. And the way the ecosystem works around BMCs, there's a couple of key companies that make the hardware, you know, Nuviton and A-Speed. And then there's a couple of key companies that make the operating systems for it. So like AMI and Vertiv and a couple of others. And then the companies that actually manufacture your motherboards just license both of those or like they buy the chips and they license the OS and they do a little bit of customization to it. And then that is sold to whoever puts the name on the on the box. And then that's what gets sent to you. And so fixing bugs is a complicated process. And so oftentimes the same bugs show up again or they just never fix it mm. because it's hard to get the communication across all these teams and companies. So in this case it was doing things like it was unauthenticated if you did authenticate, um, it was trying to use encryption, but it was a very, very, very old encryption that was trivial to break. Uh, it had hard-coded passwords in it. It had, you know, just all sorts of things. And so my proof of concept for this initially was using um, a framework called uh, Face Dancer that lets you develop USB, virtual USB devices in Python. And I wrote a backend that connected it so it would actually connect to the virtual media or vir virtual media service on the BMC. And the very first time I got it working, Face Dancer's default is to emulate a TI calculator. And so I like logged into the server and I do LSUSB and it says that there's a TI-83 plus connected. I'm like, <laughs> I don't think that's right. Right. <laughs> um, but yeah, I ended up doing a demo where I actually like plugged in a virtual USB stick uh, across the internet over to a server uh, many states away. And it was actually just a file on my drive locally. And this is kind of terrifying because, um, you know, this was unauthenticated access. So you could literally, if you could find a way to talk to one of these BMCs, you could plug in any USB device you wanted, um, which seems like not a big deal until you think about it a little bit more and you're like, oh, that's actually terrifying. <laughs> right. <laughs> wow. So what was the uh, the reception like when you put this out? Was there, um, obviously we've had uh, recently some uh, vulnerability discoveries that caused some hysteria, I would say. Uh, was there a, a lot of feedback uh, when, you, when you put this out there? You know, on one hand, fo there was a lot of folks that showed up that said, oh, you figured this out too? Yeah. Right? Like, this was just sort of an open secret that BMCs, I actually had someone write to me and say that finding vulnerabilities in BMCs was unsportsmanlike. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, there, it, like, there was that sort of reception. And then on the other hand, there were a lot of folks who just had no idea that this functionality existed in the first place. Mm -hmm. And then to see that you could abuse it in this way um, was absolutely terrifying. Um, so I did end up getting some national press and things for it, but it really didn't have a, a huge... I, I mean, I did some talks on it, but it wasn't... It didn't cause the fervor that some of the more recent vulnerabilities that, that show up on literally everyone. And part of that was right. just that most people try not to put their BMCs on the internet. Um, right. 
it turned out that as part of this, I, I have a friend who happens to run an internet exchange. And so he let me have a VM and I ran a scan of the entire internet for affected BMCs and came back. And so, you know, part of the, the story was actually that I found, you know, 30,000 plus BMCs that I could just arbitrarily plug USB devices into. Um, right. Cause I mean, like, obviously the, the USB part is, is bad, but you have to have access to it. Right. right. So it being on the network is kind of the, the prereq. And how, I mean, how does that, how does that happen? <laughs> uh, a lot of people just don't know. I mean, they just, they're like, oh, I got this cool feature from the vendor that says I can do remote management. Let me just plug that in so I can do it from home. Right? Not thinking about the vulnerabilities that it might have or, or anything else. And so there's just, I see. how do you actually do the risk assessment of equipment that you're buying? And that's a perennial problem. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's, there's, there doesn't seem to be a good answer to that. 